For those of you that don't know me, my name is Leslie Hollingsworth, and on behalf of the National Alumni Board, it is my pleasure as president of the Alumni Association to welcome you to the annual Trinity University Alumni Awards Dinner. We're so pleased that so many trustees, administrators, faculty, staff, and guests can join us this evening as we recognize our awardees. Ben White, class of 51, posthumously awarded the Spirit of Trinity, and Michael McCall, class of 1984, the Distinguished Alumnus Award. Now we all know that Trinity University offers a transformational education for talented students today. And Trinity prepares its students to be adaptive, successful adults through academic programs that cultivate both intellectual focus and civic engagement. So it should be no surprise to you that we recognize two graduates who have displayed these very same characteristics. We are especially proud to be able to claim both of these extraordinary people as alumni of this institution and are gratified by the example that they have set for students. Now before we begin dinner, I'd like to recognize a few people who will be part of the program this evening. And then after dinner, I'll introduce a few more. So to my left, I mean, excuse me, my right, Danny Anderson, our newly inaugurated president. Our distinguished alumnus, Mike McCall, class of 18, 1984. With him is his spouse, Linda McCall. And the rest of the family, please wave and, or stand to be recognized. Andy Taylor, class of 84, will be introducing Michael later this evening. Now, Brittany Habe, class of 2015, will tell us about her time with Spirit of, Awardee, uh, Spirit of Trinity awardee Ben White. Um, and we're so honored that Sharon Borders and Ann Nicholas, Ben's daughters, could join us this evening. Will the rest of, of the White family please stand and be recognized that are here with us? So without further ado, University Chaplain Reverend Nickel, would you please come to the podium and give our invocation? And after the invocation, we'll have dinner, and, in, and then followed in, following dinner, we'll return to the program. Thank you. Let us lift up our hearts in prayer. O eternal God, you have set within us a spirit which answers to your own. It is by your loving providence alone that we gather this evening, and for that we are thankful. We come to celebrate your servants, Michael McCall and Ben White of blessed memory. We celebrate their passions, creativity, leadership and character that have witnessed to the richness of your creation. May their stories stir memories of other personal heroes, those who have taught us, coached us, led us, pastored us, healed us, nurtured us. May we be reminded too of ways in which you call us to be heroes to others, loving servants of family, community, nation and world. Now bless our food and fellowship that they may satisfy our hunger for both, we pray. Amen. Okay, I'd like to first recognize the National Alumni Board members present this evening. It is the committee of this board that goes through the award nominations to find just the right alumni to, or, uh, alumni to honor. Would the directors of the National Alumni Board please stand and be recognized. We also have with us several Board of Trustee members. Would you all please stand and be recognized.
Tonight, we are also pleased to have with us several previous alumni award recipients. First, I would like to recognize the distinguished alumni in the audience. Please stand or wave a hand when I call your name. Raymond Judd, class of 1956. Bob McLean, class of 1961. Tom Hill, class of 1968. Jim Dickey, class of 1968. Robert Hollyman, class of 1976. and Doug Hawthorne, classes 69 and 72. With the Spirit of Trinity awardees in the room, please stand as I call your name. Mary Jane Judd, class of 1957. Lucia Street, class of 1959. and Eric Menger, class of 1966. And recipients of our Greek Alumni Advisor of the Year Award, John Mace, class of 1971. And Jeannie McGee Culver, class of 1982. Thank y'all all. As you just heard, Trinity University Alumni Association recognizes alumni with three awards annually. A fourth award, the Honorary Alumni Citation, has been given to only three people by the current Alumni Association. One of Trinity's former presidents, Dr. Ron Calgard. His wife, Jeannie Calgard. And Dr. Colleen Grissom, who have, <laughs> the three of them served Trinity and the community for many years. Thank y'all. Okay, so we also have special groups here tonight who want that are here to honor the awardees. We have a group of Bengal Lancers to honor Congressman Mike McCall. So can I have the Lancers stand and be recognized? <laughs> All right, we have some football players in the house to recognize Ben White. Can we have some of them stand and be recognized? <laughs> also here for Mike McCall, we have alumni from the class of 1984. Can you please stand and be recognized? without Kai Betas, that is so true. <laughs> All right, so our two astounding alumni that we're recognizing. The Distinguished Alumni Award honors achievement and service that is recognized at the highest level nationally and internationally. The award dates back to 1961. The Spirit of Trinity Award is given to a loyal alumnus or alumna who embodies what it means to be a Trinitonian. The award recognizes excellence and service to the community or the university. So to tell us about our first honoree, Ben White, it is my pleasure to call to the podium, Brittany Havey. As you drive into a road away from San Antonio, the hill country opens up before you. The flat concrete turns into hills adorned with trees, manicured shrubs to wild pear bushes. 
lap dogs to white-tailed deer. And when you make it out to where I grew up, nine miles past 1604, you'll see a herd of goats and a miniature donkey named Jackie. About a mile past us, on the left, you'll see a couple of American flags waving proudly and flanking the driveway of a man who brought many of us here tonight and me to Trinity. That man was Ben White. I'm unclear exactly when Ben came into my family's life, but what I do know is some of my earliest memories include him. Ben's property was gorgeous. San Geronimo Creek runs straight through it, and I have many memories of when my family and I were able to enjoy visiting. We swam, collected tadpoles, and fish for gigantic catfish with pieces of bread attached to a hook. One of the funnier memories I have of going to Ben's house is when he asked if my brother, Sean, and I could bring his riding lawnmower <laughs> back to our house so my dad could work on it for him. I'll never forget falling behind my brother in my dad's Dodge truck with the hazards lights on and going down Bandera Road, inching along at what seemed like negative 10 miles per hour. It really doesn't get more redneck than riding a lawnmower down the highway. <laughs> but, but we were willing to look like rednecks for Ben. We were neighbors, and to say you're a neighbor with someone when you live out in the Helotus Hill Country could mean either they live right next door or they live a few miles down the road. There are not many people who live where we do, so neighbors are hard to come by, especially neighbors like Ben White. Ben showed his kindness in many different ways. He would drop by our house regularly just to say hello, usually getting out of his car with an exclamation of, howdy neighbor. With these visits, he would also bring us our mail from the post office, which I think was just his way of having an excuse to drop by, which we, of course, didn't mind. Sometimes we'd even bring a, he would even bring us a box of church's chicken. The box would only include dark meat chicken, no white, no white pieces, because Ben grew up counting pennies and saving them wherever he could. And it would be just a box of chicken, no sides included. <laughs> But again, we weren't complaining because, you know, free chicken is free chicken. <laughs> so, thank you, Ben. One of the best gifts that Ben gave me personally didn't come in a box. He truly gave me the gift of Trinity University. When I was applying for schools, I was determined to go out of state, nowhere in Texas, much less San Antonio. But Ben, as a proud Trinity alumni that he was, kept telling me time after time to apply to Trinity. At the same time he was telling me this, my high school softball team was making a run for the state playoffs. And the assistant coach for Trinity softball team, now our head coach, had contacted me about playing as a Trinity Tiger. However, throughout high school, I'd never been very serious about playing softball at the collegiate level because I wanted to focus more on getting a high level edu of education. As a high school senior in my last season of softball, I lived and breathed the sport and couldn't see myself doing anything else in life. Uh, as a, wait, sorry about that. Uh, fortunately, during his great academic and athletic reputation, I recognized the opportunity to continue my softball career while also attaining my goal of receiving a highly respected education. Ben, as I mentioned earlier, was mindful of his money, yet he was a generous financial supporter of Trinity. He saw the value of Trinity, and therefore, so did I. And Trinity was exactly what I needed, and I truly wouldn't have realized that I needed it without Ben's guidance. I applied, was accepted, and began my journey as a Trinity Tiger in the fall of 2011. As I grew as a Trinity Tiger, so did Ben's support. He is well known as a big supporter of not only Trinity's academics, but Trinity's athletics. In my sophomore year, when my softball team needed funding to keep the live broadcast of our home games, Ben stepped up and donated to the team. Ben was beloved around my Trinity softball family. He attended every one of my home games that he could, health permitting. The Trinity parents loved talking to him, and I always had teammates telling me how sweet he was. I loved looking at the stand from my position in right field and seeing him there in his usual spot. During football season, his usual spot was in the top row of the stands with his seat straddling the 50-yard line. Upon graduation, I traded my usual spot in the softball field for the football field. 
I'm currently a resident in the Bay Area of California where I work for the 49ers as the first woman hired in the Department of Analytics. When I, <laughs> Thank you. When I first arrived in California, I had every intention of sending Ben a letter thanking him for everything he did for me. But as life goes, I got busy with my new job and time passed. But then I developed a very strong feeling that I needed to write to Ben as soon as possible. At the time, I didn't know how important that feeling or the letter that I wrote would become. But I would like to share that letter with you today. Ben, I've been meaning to write to you for a while, but they're keeping me busy here at the Niners. I wanted to write to you to tell you thank you for everything you've done, not only for me, but for my entire family. We are better versions of ourselves because of you. We are truly blessed to have such a kind, generous neighbor. I'm proud to be a Trinity Tiger along with you, and I'm so glad you came to see me play all those times. I adored seeing you in the stands along with my parents. Your support not only on the field, but financially gave me opportunities I would not have had otherwise. I truly believe I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for your generosity. You have been the support my family needs, and for that I am forever grateful. You deserve the world. I have good reason to believe that, reasons that have been validated time and time again. I hope my career and life leads me to be even half the man you are. I hope to see you soon. Love, Brittany Havey. Ben passed away a month after I sent this letter. I'm so glad I listened to the feeling I had that day in November and told him the words that I needed him to hear. Ben made an impact and continues to make an impact on both my family and Trinity as a whole. I don't know any person who is more proud to be a Trinity Tiger. He was the epitome of what it means to be a Trinity Tiger, and there is really no one else who deserves the Spirit of Trinity Award as much as Ben White. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for having me. And please welcome to the stage Dr. Anderson and Ben's daughter, Sharon and Ann. Sharon and Ann, will you please come forward? So you have heard this testimony about the incredible example that Ben White is in terms of Spirit of Trinity. And on behalf of Trinity University and the Alumni Association, it is a real honor to present this award posthumously to Ben and for you to accept it. As we have been sitting here, sitting on the table in front of Sharon and Ann tonight, has been the obelisk that symbolizes our recognition of all that he has given to us. And this is a plaque that gives a citation recognizing his contributions, and I want to read it briefly. For the strong work ethic that enabled him to attend Trinity, for his distinguished career as an auto fuel researcher, for his lifelong support of Trinity and its athletic program, for his volunteerism for the San Antonio Chapter Board, for his years of service on the National Alumni Board, for mentoring alumni and students at local networking events, for generating enthusiasm among his classmates and increasing attendance at alumni weekends, for his steadfast loyalty, and for a life lived wholeheartedly in the spirit of Trinity. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know when Dad first received the letter last summer that he was going to be honored tonight. He was very surprised, very honored, but he couldn't quite figure it out because it said the wrong year on it. <laughs> Instead of saying 2016, it said 2015, but the letter came in June and it said February 2015. So he had a good time giving Mary Kay and whoever else sent the letter a bad time about it. But. He was looking forward to this event and um, 
unfortunately we did lose him in December, but we know where he is. And uh, I just want to say that Trinity meant a lot to my sister and I as we grew up. Both of our parents graduated from this school. They met here, dad had already graduated, mom came as a freshman, and they were married after her one semester. So, um, but we grew up coming here. I went for a walk, we got here early to go find the little garden with the rock path through it. Um, that was one of our favorite places when we were here, to so come walk around in there. But my strongest memory is the day I went down the rocks and the scorpion that had to be in my shoe that I didn't know about stung me. So that was not a good memory, but it was one we had here. And also coming to see the tiger in the cage in front of the bookstore. So we got to come see the tiger before we walked to the football game. I don't know where we parked, but of course we had to walk across the whole campus before we got to Alamo Stadium where Trinity played. So we grew up in Trinity. Dad made sure that we knew we were going to college. Um, as Brittany had kind of hinted to, he was a little frugal. No, he didn't pay for us to go here, but he made sure we went to college. <laughs> but just to let you know, my sister and I both have college degrees. He has four grandchildren. They all have college degrees, are gainfully employed, and have the work ethic that he taught us and that he learned, like I said, from growing up, born during the Depression, and he had that work ethic that he taught us as well. But I said, Trinity was a big part of our lives because we came here. Oh, one other story. He decided I might need glasses because I needed the binoculars to read the scoreboard at the football game. <laughs> so. Good evening. I didn't know she was going to say all that. I can shorten my speech. <laughs> I'm going to give you just a very short, quick background. Um, Dad's name, Benjamin Franklin Wine, he was named after his grandfather. He was born July 25th, 1929. And if you're a student of history, you know what was happening in the world then, the Great Depression. He spent the first 10 years of his life, formative years of his life, surviving the Depression. Watching his parents, who did not have the opportunity to go to college, did not have the opportunity to attend high school, my grandfather was born in 1889 in Ovilla, near Waxahachie, near Cumberland Presbyterian Church. That will come up in just a second. My grandmother was born in 1901. They were 12 years apart because the Great War happened, the war to end all wars, World War I. Texas proudly sent 1,908 Native sons to fight in that war for our freedoms. 5,000 of them and one nurse, according to the Texas Historical Society, died in World War I. Why is that important? That's how my grandparents met out in West Texas. My grandfather was driving supply trucks for General Pershing to chase Pancho Villa. We have a picture out there of this supply truck. They took the tires off because the banditos kept shooting them. Put tank, tank tracks on it, covered up the radiator with steel plate so they couldn't shoot that. And he was one of the drivers along the Texas-Mexico border to help keep General Pershing's troops supplied while they were chasing Pancho Villa. That's how my grandparents met. 1929, the Great Depression. So the Great War and the Great Depression influenced my father's life. My dad and my uncle and my aunt all talked about having pinto beans and cornbread and being thankful that that's what they had. Because he said there were people that didn't have that. My mother, who did go here, was from Elmira, New York. My grandmother had to teach her how to make pinto beans and cornbread. Because <laughs> she didn't know how to make that. So he observed the strong work ethic of his parents, working hard. My grandfather with a sixth grade education, my grandmother with an eighth grade education, didn't have the opportunity that we have nowadays to attend a wonderful university like this. But that work ethic was there, because my grandfather worked any job he could. A chauffeur, a cowboy, a mechanic, water company, machine maintenance. Anything he could to keep food on the table for his family. That was the ethic that we learned, that he taught his daughters, my cousins over there, his other nieces and nephews. 
when you came out to my dad's, you did work. We worked hard, but we played hard. And he would have a bit of uh, the Irish leprechaun in him, and he would pay us a quarter a box to fill a shoe box with sticker bars so he wouldn't have to pick them. <laughs> he would pay my cousins a dollar if they would keep their arm in the ice water bucket from the hand crank ice cream. Whoever of those five boys could keep that arm in the water longest got a dollar. You never saw five boys run for a hand crank ice cream machine. Just stick that arm in there and he'd pay up every time. But we worked hard and we played hard. Now, um, as Ann said, we came to Trinity frequently as children. Mother and dad would come and watch the tennis matches. We'd wander around. We watched them dig the hole for the swimming pool. She found the scorpion. I found that if you take those little red beans off the mountain little trees, rub them on the ground, it gets hot, and I can stick her on the arm with it. And I tended to torment her a little bit. But Dad always stressed the importance of education to us. Since we were children, you will go to college. You need to study for that test. You need to do your best. Work hard and do your best. That depression mentality, academics, business, and, as my sister said, we've all achieved our education. Now, he had other several beliefs that were important to him. He loved his family, he served God through his church, and he loved America. He concentrated on higher education, trying to help as many people as he could. These beliefs, I believe, support the spirit of Trinity. He entered Trinity in 1945, but didn't get to graduate until 1951. He had to work nights at Knowlton's Creamery, or sorting mail in the post office downtown in order to pay his tuition fees because his parents couldn't afford to pay his tuition. He lived at home with them on West Mulberry, right over there. And he carried that work ethic through his job and set examples for us. He encouraged high school students in our areas when he got on the Hoheim Prairie Insurance Board in addition to Trinity. Um, he found out that there was scholarship money that wasn't being awarded because they didn't know about it. He called John Marshall High School counselors. He talked to Oliver and Holmes counselors, Sandra Day O'Connor, Bandera High Schools, and talked to those counselors and told them about these scholarships that were available free. Money's here, nobody's claiming it. And he helped students from our local area start their academic career that way, along with the Girl Scouts and the library and the volunteer fire departments. He continued the Spirit of Trinity outside of that with community service outreach through his church. Our mom and dad taught Sunday school at Trinity Baptist Church. Later on in his life, he was a member of Cornerstone Church, and his wife Jan led several adult ministries there, helped with single women's ministries. He was always having people out and parties out at the creek, having people out there sharing what God had blessed him with, with other people. He was a great networker. He listened to what people would say. And if you heard a need that he could meet, he would meet it. If not, he would try to connect you to that money or whatever it was you needed. That's how he helped with those scholarships with Hoheim Prairie Insurance. Now, how does this parallel Trinity? Trinity was established in 1869 by the Cumberland Presbyterians in East Texas. I'm not going to try and say that name because I messed it up earlier. Tawakana. And forgive me for not saying that right. It was relocated to Waxahachie in 1902, moved to San Antonio in 1942. When Dad attended, he was going to what he called the Woodlawn Campus in Quonset Huts. In 1945, the school acquired what was called a rock quarry to build this current campus. Construction begins in 1950. Dad graduates in 1951. He was a little aggravated about that, not getting to go to the new buildings. And the campuses begin here in 1952. And as Ann stated, the best thing was coming to the football games to see the tiger. Is the tiger going to be there, Daddy? How long is the tiger? Are those his real whiskers? Do they have to file his teeth to keep him from biting people? Do they have to cut his claws? He said, the most important thing to know is two feet. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's how far he can reach out of that cage. You need to stay two feet away from him. He's like, yes, sir. So 
Athletics, he supported athletics. He loved coming here for that. We came to tennis matches, we came to basketball, we came to football especially. But community service, the love of country, carrying this through the community, sharing that Trinity spirit, not just here, but out in the world. That's the spirit of Trinity. That was my dad, Benjamin Franklin White. Well, that was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, that truly was. Um, ben did live the spirit of Trinity, and the stories that y'all told this evening were amazing. And I'm honored to have known him um, for a short period of time, and and honored that y'all were y'all were here tonight to share that with everybody. Um, so, to move us to our distinguished alumnus award. Michael McCall, we're going to be joined by Andy Taylor, his sweet mate, back in 1984. So I'm sure we're going to have some good stories. At least I hope we are. Thank you. Do you want to hear some stories? Yeah. Mutually assured destruction. <laughs> when your chairman of the Homeland Security Committee for the United States Congress. You know all about that concept. We know what it means. Mutually assured destruction is that which causes you not to use your arsenal for fear that the incoming Scud missile will be even more powerful than what you have to dish out. <laughs> and so when I think about the concept of mutually assured destruction, I don't think of it from the perspective of being chairman of Homeland Security. I think of it as being Mike's roommate, and there is not a chance that I would say anything about those years tonight for fear of what Michael might bring back to me. <clears throat> you're, you're safe. In all seriousness, Trinity University is, is family. Um, for me, it's very personal. I, I look at Ron Calgard and um, I think about the fact that my father, uh, Tex Taylor, uh, served as vice president under him and uh, Dr. Lowry for 41 years. Um, I think of Raymond Judd, who officiated in uh, my wedding 25 years ago and who buried my father and my mother and my brother and um, have been friends for, for life. I think about the fact that just two houses behind us here at 447 East Rosewood, that's where I uh, lived for 25 years in a university home. And I look around and I say, Trinity's family. It really is. And when you think about family, I think about this guy over here, Michael McCall. Um, he's like a brother, but he also is trying literally to keep all of us as a family safe. Can you imagine what it must be like every morning when he gets up and he gets his daily intelligence briefing? That's a lot of stress. That's a lot of responsibility. He knows things and threats that are out there that you and I will never know. And I want to tell you, Michael, uh, my hat's off to you for keeping this whole entire family, our American family, safe. <clears throat> There's some members of Congress that are arrogant. They're so arrogant, they've convinced themselves that they're humble. That's not Mike McCall. Mike, I can tell you from having known him up close and personal for 35 years, is a very humble man. You know one of the first things he did when he got into Congress? He introduced a bill, and it's called the No Monuments to Me legislation. He said that I am against using tax dollars to fund something that's going to be named after a sitting member of Congress. Isn't that amazing? Right off the bat, he said, I want to make a statement that this is not about me, Mike McCall. This is about the American people. And that's why Mike is a humble man. Um, he serves um, in District 10 
Uh, that district is one that I'm familiar with because I actually helped draw it. Um, I'm an election lawyer and, um, and was involved in redistricting. And a little known secret that is going to get out tonight uh, is uh, about three in the morning one night, I just sort of, you know, changed that district to surround that house that Michael was living in. And the rest is history. Six terms that he's served. CD10. <laughs> It's the Highway 290 district. It combines the urban areas of uh, Austin, Travis County, and Houston, Harris County, and all of the connecting rural counties in between. And uh, it amazes me, Michael, because I live in that district and I see how often you're down there, um, how you've been able to connect with all folks no matter what their persuasion is, no matter what their finances are, no matter what their issues are, you've been able to be the congressman for everybody in the district, not just a few. And my hat's off to you for that as well. <clears throat> One example is um, uh, legislation that Michael's very proud of. Linda uh, was instrumental in this. Um, it's called the Creating Hope Act. And I'm not going to go into the details. Michael might mention it tonight, but um, he found a way to incentivize research and development private dollars to actually try to find ways to help pediatric orphans who are suffering from cancer. And it's an amazing thing that Michael championed, and it became law. And there are young children who are being helped as a result of it. So my hat's off to you again, Michael, for that. I um, also want to mention that uh, uh, Mike's come out with a book. I don't know if you know that. It's called Failures of Imagination. Um, it recently was the number one bestseller on Amazon in national security. Um, and what's really cool about this book, it's a no-holds-barred, uh, uh, I think, honest assessment of the threats that we face, not just in cybersecurity, not just in uh, terroristic ways, but in many other ways, both domestically and internationally. And um, I would highly recommend that you take a look because it tells the truth about where our country is and the failures that we've had, and then how to thwart uh, future attacks. And so um, I just want to say, as uh, Michael's really close friend, um, as a, almost a brother, um, as a member of this American family, how proud I am to ask uh, you to each congratulate um, our distinguished alumnus this year, uh, Mike McCall, Congressman, six terms from CD10, Michael T. McCall. And so Dr. Anderson and Mike, can you come up here? It is an honor on behalf of Trinity University and the Alumni Association to present you this award for your incredible record of public service and remarkable distinguished contributions to our country. Congratulations, Congressman McCall, Alumnus Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Citation. I, I want to formally let everyone know what is on the plaque here. In recognition of his service to the state of Texas as a federal prosecutor, deputy attorney, attorney general, and for representing the 10th Congressional District of Texas in the United States House of Representatives for his tireless efforts to keep America safe as chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security, for his strong pro-growth, pro-jobs voting record, for his outstanding leadership in championing the nation's innovation economy and enhancing Texas' role as a global leader in the high-tech industry, for crafting successful legislation to advance the fight against childhood cancer, and for the honor and distinction he brings to his alma mater. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, well, well, well. Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? I always thought Andy would be the politician, not me, uh, when I first met him. But he does adhere to the principles of the old 
Soviet doctrine, um, basically the mutual assured destruction doctrine, which is one of the reasons why I picked him to introduce me. Because there are many others in the room <laughs> that I could have picked that wouldn't have adhered to the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. In fact, it may be more akin to suicide bombing. <laughs> I think about Tom Fisher, you know, one of my best friends from college. Uh, there's Greg Love and uh, Andy Bonner, no chance. You weren't even on the list. I wasn't going to touch that one. But, uh, I tell you, this is, it's such an honor, and, and I do want to recognize Andy's father, Tex Taylor, who was vice president of this great uh, university for 41 years, and did such a great job for Trinity University. I have to, there are uh, uh, emails and text messages floating around between the Lancers and the Chi Betas and a, a few pictures on the internet, and we're going to have a great reunion tonight. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about those stories tonight here at the podium. Uh, we'll be joined, I think, later at the Bombay Bicycle Club and possibly the Esquire uh, downtown, one of our favorite uh, hangouts. Uh, and the other reason I, I chose Andy is because we have uh, President Calgard, who I had so much respect for. Uh, he, was, he was the leader when we were here, believe it or not, 31 years ago. It's hard to say that. And I'm not sure if the statute of limitations has run out on some of the stories that uh, some of my other uh, friends could have told here tonight. But to my professors, God love you. You may be just as surprised as I am that I'm standing up here. <laughs> and, and to Lowry May is my, my father-in-law, who's become a second uh, father to me. He um, really um, is an inspiration and embodies the American dream. A true success story. My mother-in-law, uh, my favorite, my only mother-in-law, uh, Peggy Mays. <laughs> you know, you get in, you get along with your mother-in-law when you get trapped in an elevator, and you survive to tell about it. And that happened to us about a month ago. <laughs> Quite an experience. And finally, Linda, uh, my wife, who we actually met at the Air and Space Museum in Washington D.C. I was working at the Justice Department. She was. Uh, uh, working for Naval Intelligence. She actually knew Andy, which gave me some carte blanche when I uh, met her. And I asked her, you know, what, what do you do for Naval Intelligence? Why, well, you know, I track Soviet submarines. And I said, wow, I've never really dated somebody that tracks Soviet submarines. <laughs> do you want to go out with me? <laughs> and, uh, and she tracked me, and, and I'm forever, <laughs> I'm forever grateful that, that she did. And we have five teenagers. So, uh, so 1918 triple to 14. So in my house, uh, we have our own homeland security issues. Trust me. Uh, in fact, we call it domestic terrorism. Uh, but let me just say, it, it, it is such. Um, God, looking back on the experience, and you know, as we come back to the, this great university, you know, the friendships you make here last for a lifetime. And I think that's exemplified by the turnout that we got by my sisters in the Chi Beta and the brothers in the Lancers and, and the class of 1984 in general. I know there are a couple of Trinitiers here as well. Um, but these, they do prepare you for life. You know, according to U.S. News and World Report, it gives you one of the best educations. Uh, but it also instills the values and character, I think, necessary to uh, have a purpose-driven life. And education is so important because it can lift one's spirit, one dignity, and a platform for achievement. Trinity taught us to believe in ourselves and something greater than ourselves, to make a difference in this world, leaving it a better place than when we came into it. And that is the ultimate test of anyone's life. I remember when I uh, graduated from Trinity, my father died soon thereafter. And I had a dream about him flying over rooftops together. And it was a very spectacular dream. And it, it, um, at the time, I remember him telling me how amazing it was that we could fly if you just believe. Um, when I realized to find the laws of physics didn't really make any sense, I started to fall from the sky to the ground. And it reminded me kind of the story of St. Peter when he walked on the water and he, and he um, 
fell and the limitations of man. And I believe the lesson that he was trying to teach me, if he was trying to communicate with me, was really to believe in yourself, uh, to dream. If you don't dream, you won't achieve your God-given talents. It's really about finding your passion. When I talk to, to kids in high schools and grade school and in colleges, I talk about finding your passion and purpose in life and applying the work ethic that you talked about to achieve that goal. It's really about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to pursue dreams you never thought were possible in your life. The Greeks define happiness as full use of powers along lines of excellence. And as a history major here at Trinity, I always found strength in the words of leaders who went before us. One of the ones that kept me through my first um, campaign, which was a very ugly, bitter campaign I ran as a positive candidate, was Teddy Roosevelt's speech about the man in the arena. And it always inspired me. He said, it's not the, it's not the critic that counts, which I thought was so important. The critic will say anything. The critic will tell you why you can't do something, why you can't dream. Rather, he says, it's about the man in the arena who falls and stumbles, but who spends himself for a worthy cause. And as Teddy Roosevelt said, his place shall never be with the cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I chose public service because I believe it is a worthy cause. And I know that there are many politicians today who I think downgrade the profession, but I do think it's worthy. And I chose national security because I, we live in a dangerous world at a dangerous time. And I want to make this world and this country a safer place. As the chairman of this committee on Homeland Security, it's my job to identify the threats outside the United States and make sure that they don't come into this country. Simply put, it's to protect the American people. And we've stopped a lot of bad things. We've arrested over 82 ISIS followers. That's more than one per week. We've stopped a lot of bad plots from happening in the United States. But you can't always get it right. What keeps me up at night is when a Chattanooga happens or a San Bernardino occurs and we missed it. And we couldn't get that. We can't catch it all. And it is at such a global level over the internet, it's very, very challenging uh, to stop. I think as Andy mentioned, one of my proudest legislative accomplishments was actually working with Linda uh, to address the greatest threat to our children, and that is cancer. Passing the Creating Hope Act into law led to the first childhood cancer drug development since the 1980s, profoundly changing the field of pediatric oncology. I think if anything, saving lives, protecting Americans, but protecting our children from that disease is probably one of the most gratifying experiences. Unfortunately, there's another threat I see on the horizon. That's sort of my job is to identify threats. I see a very polarizing and partisan nature of politics in Washington, which places service to oneself over others in the best interest of the nation. This is something George Washington warned about and talked about in his farewell address many years ago. I still believe that we can and we must restore civility and respect in our public discourse as envisioned by our founding fathers. My father was a World War II veteran. He flew combat missions as a bombardier in a B-17 in support of the D-Day invasion against one of the most evil forces known to mankind. His generation, often called the greatest, handed down a better America to my generation. I believe it's the responsibility of our generation to hand down a better America to the next. I had the great honor last May to visit Normandy, and I laid a wreath in their honor, that generation, their honor, at the memorial site, surrounded by all the white crosses, while they played taps. It was perhaps the most moving experience of my lifetime. Their generation, defined by Churchill and Roosevelt, defeated fascism. Another generation, defined by Kennedy and Reagan, defeated communism. And the greatest generational struggle of our lifetime 
is to defeat radical Islamist extremism. I remember traveling to Iraq during the height of the war, and a soldier pointed out to an ancient archaeological structure, and he said, do you see that house? I said, uh, yeah. He said, that's the house of Abraham. And it struck me, and I thought to myself, that is the house from which sprang the three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And then we went to the holy city of Jerusalem, divided along these three religions. Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided cannot stand. I look forward to the day when these three religions can coexist peacefully under God's house. It may not happen in my lifetime. In fact, I'm certain that it won't. But it is my sincere hope that it will happen in the next generation and happen in their lifetime. For in the final analysis, at the end of the day, we all pass from this earth. But what we believed in and dreamed of while here on earth remains. President Kennedy talked about a new generation and perhaps put it best in his inaugural address when he said, with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking for his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Thank you, Trinity University, for all you've done for me and for this distinguished award. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight for this special occasion to recognize two of our Alumni Association's finest. We are proud to claim them as our own and to honor them tonight. We're also blessed to have such a deep pool of alumni with the qualifications to make them worthy of consideration for these honors. We would like to thank all of you who took the time to submit nominations this year, as well as the National Alumni Board Committee that had the tough choices in making this year's selections. While the board chooses the honorees, we encourage, encourage everyone to continue to provide us with nominations in the coming years and to bring to our attention the exceptional alumni of Trinity University. Congratulations again to our honorees. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Have fun tonight, be safe, good night. <laughs>